Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. Yeah. Say, praise the Lord, Bridgeway. Yeah. Now, one more time for the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. Yeah. It is so good to see you all in the house of the Lord here in Columbia, Maryland, as well as those of you in our Owings Mills, Ricerstown campus. It's great to see you there as well, and we sure pray that God's word would touch you in a very special way today. In Columbia, we did some baby dedications as well as we commissioned pa uh, Pastor uh, Joel Sorber, I'm just saying that prophetically, but right now missionary Joel Sorber to go off to South Africa and minister, and uh, to Jared Sorber and Amy and your brother Jake, we want to say congratulations. So we wanted you to know that at Owens Mills, and also for you uh, four families that uh, dedicated your children to all your family and friends, may God just uh, have great favor on your children. And might you have seen a vision today of what God can do once you launch those kids into the next generation. And for all of you parents, wherever your children are on the spectrum of being a newborn infant all the way to being an adult child in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, wherever your children are, know that God loves your kids even more than you do. And he is, for those that may not have their kids in the Lord yet, don't even worry about it. Just keep praying for them. They're not even going to know what hits them when they're in the club at night. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so, all right, listen. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about Leah. We've done a three-week series, and this is the third installment of a three-week series on this Old Testament character, this woman by the name of Leah. The first message was less loved. The second message last week was labor of love, and today's message is going to be loving me. And I'm going to just say a word of prayer, and then we're going to bring this series to an end. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us more, not less. You love us no matter where we are and what we're doing. So we just pray today, Lord, as we preach this message, loving me that we would somehow be able to realize how beautiful and unconditional your love is for us, even when other human love has failed. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Together everyone said amen, amen. and amen. Well, we're going to pick it up at a key verse. We're going to read verse 20 of chapter 30 of Genesis. Genesis chapter 30, verse 20, and we'll pick it up right here. Then Leah said, God has presented me a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulon. Now, before I lift up all that's in this one verse, I want to bring you up to speed by way of review for those of you who may not have been here for this, in this, this entire story, this baby mama drama. So what happened? Jacob loved Rachel more than her older sister, Leah. Jacob agreed to work for Rachel's father for seven years to get Rachel. On the wedding night, we find out that it wasn't Rachel that he was sleeping with or married to. It was Leah. He felt deceived, and he went to the father and said, what have you done to me? And he said, it's not our custom to marry off the younger before the older, so we gave you the older first. He was deceived. How could you deceive me like that? He says, well, if you want Rachel, then you know what? Just work for me another seven years. I'll give her to you now, and you work another seven years. And so he did. He worked for a total of 14 years. And he even said after working those 14 years, those last seven years for Rachel, he was so smitten in love with her that he said it only felt like a few days. And so last week we learned that Rachel was barren, and she couldn't conceive children. And so now she's focused on the fact that, that she can't have children. So while Leah, the older sister, could have children, she still felt less loved by her husband. Now Rachel is catching some feelings because Leah can have children and she can't. In fact, Leah had four kids, and we went through all four of the boys that she had. The first one's name was Reuben which means misery. God has seen my misery. 
The second child she gave birth to was Simeon. His name was Heard. God has heard my cry. The third child was named Levi, which meant attached or joined in the Hebrew, meaning and hoping that this child would, would somehow attach her heart to Jacob's heart. But that's not what God was doing. God was trying to join her heart to his heart. And so then she has a fourth child by the name of Judah, which means praise. I will praise God. And sometimes God will take you through the birthing of different experiences in your life to finally get you to praise. Oh, my goodness, I preached that thing last week. So if you wasn't here, please go get it. You can just go to YouTube. You can catch both of those sermons on YouTube at Bridgeway MD. But we handled really all of chapter 29 those last two weeks, and now we enter into chapter 30, the first 20 verses. Now, I read you the key verse, verse 20, so that's where we'll end up, but let's pick it up at verse 1. Genesis 30, verse 1. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. So she said to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Now I want you to notice right here, jealousy and anger. They're acting like a good old married couple, aren't they? <laughs> no. But seriously, right in the midst of a relationship, this could be a, any modern day relationship in 2024. One is jealous, the other one's angry, and this is how fights and relationships begin. One feels insecure because of comparison. The other feels like they're put on the defensive and they begin fighting back. So right here at the beginning, I'm going to give you a practical application. Number one, right here. When you feel jealous, instead of lashing out at your partner, look inward to examine why you are feeling jealous. Take your jealousy and insecurity to the Lord first. Then address your partner wisely. Let me say it again. Practical application number one. When you feel jealous, instead of lashing out at your partner, look inward to examine why you are feeling jealous. Take your jealousy or insecurity to the Lord first. Then address your partner. You see, oftentimes, jealousy has more to do with you than your partner because of your insecurities. Now, it's okay to share your jealousy with your partner. Just don't start accusing them of doing something wrong and start attacking their character because of your own insecurities. And for the partner who's trying to calm your partner's jealous heart or attitude, here's a practical application for you right at the top. Practical application number two, calm your jealous partner's heart by reaffirming your love and desire for them alone. Do all you can to avoid triggering their jealousy now that you know what they're dealing with internally. Let me say it again. Calm your jealous partner's heart by reaffirming your love and desire for them alone. Do all you can to avoid triggering their jealousy now that you know what they're dealing with internally. You see, if the relationship truly matters to you, these two practical applications are really relational tips worth applying. Now back to the story, verse 3. Then she said, here's Bilhah, my maid servant. Sleep with her so that she can bear children for me and that through her I too can build a family. So Rachel's jealous heart now has her making erroneous decisions and she says, you know what, Jacob? I can't have children. I know you married Leah first and, and I know you love me more and all of that, but she had four boys and, and I haven't had anyone. So what I want you to do here, take my maidservant. Her name is Bilhah. Sleep with her. And then what will happen is she'll have a baby maybe and then we can, raise, we, we can raise a family like that. And let me just say right here, my wife and I were talking about this last night and she said, it's amazing what happens when you become emo uh, overly emotional because then you start making decisions that otherwise you might not make. And I would say that that could be true about any of us, whether a man or a woman, 
Don't allow your, your emotions and for you to become so emotional that you then allow them to push you into unwise decisions, life-altering decisions. It can be buying a car or buying a cat or sleeping with someone that you shouldn't or, or skipping a class or quitting work or walking out of a relationship or yelling at your boss. You can become so overly emotional, you begin to make erroneous and emotional decisions that become life-altering. And here we, have, here we have Rachel saying, take my maidservant, Bilhah, and sleep with her. Now, culturally, this was fine to do in this male-dominated culture. But it was Rachel's jealous heart of comparison that was motivating her behind this plan. That was the motivating factor. And, of course, Jacob, being, the, I'm sure, the cool and righteous man of God, probably said, oh, dear, no, I would never sleep with your maid servant. No, let's just pray and wait on the Lord to bless us. Besides, I worked 14 years to have your love, babe, and the last seven years was like just a few days. I just want you, sweetheart. You think that's what Jacob said? <laughs> nope. Verse 4. <laughs> so she gave him her servant Bilhah as a wife. Jacob slept with her. And she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan, which means, Dan means vindicated. So the next time you meet a Dan, or if you run into our former pastor, Dan Taylor, just look at him and say, hey, Dan, you've been vindicated. He'll look at you and be like, what did I do? Let's pick it up at verse 7. Rachel's servant Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Hold on. Did, did Rachel give Bilhah to him again? Well, I, I think they probably were married at this point, so I guess it was all good. And I'm sure Jacob was just being a kind man doing his civic duty as he was serving the loving community of women. But I digress. Let's pick it up at verse 8. Then Rachel said, I have had a great struggle with my sister, speaking of Leah, and I have won. So she named him Naphtali, which means struggle. So now we can clearly see that what we have here is a baby competition going on. A competition, comparison, jealousy. That's simply unhealthy, friends. And it's almost like, well, my maidservant had more children than your maidservant. This is nothing but baby mama drama at its worst. So let me give you a third practical application. Stop being jealous and start being joyous. Stop being jealous and start being joyous. Jealousy has a way of embittering your spirit because you're focused on what other people have instead of celebrating and being content with what you have. Stop looking at other people's blessings and start thanking God for the blessings he's given you. There's probably somebody jealous of you because of what you have. And you don't even see what you have because you're looking at what somebody else has. And so what God is saying to you is, listen, the state that I have you in, be thankful for, to me right now for what you have and stop focusing on other people. Start thanking God. Stop being jealous and start being joyous. Besides, you'll remember what I said joy stands for, J-O-Y, Jesus overflowing in you. Start focusing on Jesus and the gifts that he's blessed you with and stop trying to keep up with the Joneses. By the way, who are the Joneses? I don't know. You know, joy is a discipline. Jealousy is a distraction. So stop comparing and, and stop complaining and start thanking and praising and being careful to be grateful to God for what you do have. It's okay to talk to God about the desires of your heart and to cry out to him. And instead of lashing out at other people that you're jealous of, turn to God. Because you know what? Jealousy only leads to, to covetousness. I'm jealous and now I'm covetous. I want what you have. I want your house. I want your spouse. I want your car. I want your degree. I want this, 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 and this. 
And if it doesn't lead to that extreme joy, jealousy leading to covetousness, then it could lead the other way to self-condemnation. I'm nothing. Nothing ever good happens to me. And let me just tell you, one of the best ways to beat jealousy is to celebrate with others. Truly live out the seventh saying of a gracious, which says, I will celebrate with you. It's one of the best cures for jealousy. The reality is, someone's always going to have something better than you. So deal with it. Someone's going to have more money than you. Someone's going to have more children than you. And even if they don't have more children, their children are going to, I have to break the news to you, their children are going to be smarter than yours. <laughs> now, you feel good because your children can at least beat up their children, but still, I'm saying, <laughs> don't allow the emotion of jealousy to push you down a path where you're making erroneous decisions. Check yourself and begin to remember what God has done for you. And thank God for who he's made you and what he has for you. But you can see what's going on with them. It's like, you know, you've got a maid servant, I've got a maid servant. So now I'm going to give my maid servant to him, and, and, and now you're going to give your maid servant to him. And now they're having this baby competition. Check it out, verse 9. When Leah saw, remember Leah? When Leah saw that she had not stopped, she has now stopped having children. So she had her four. She took her maidservant, Zilpah, and gave her to Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. Poor Jacob. <laughs> Keep reading the text, DA. Then Leah said, what good fortune. So she named him Gad, which means good fortune. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy I am. The women will call me happy. So she named him Asher, which means happy. Now we see that Leah gave her maidservant up to Jacob, and she ended up having two more sons. So let's get this right. Rachel, who could have no kids, gave Bilhah to Jacob and said, give me two sons. So she gave, he, she bore to him Dan, which means vindicated, Naphtali, which means struggle. Rachel's thinking, I got vindicated in my struggle. I'm winning. In fact, she says in verse 8, I have won. Dang. But wait, Leah's maidservant, Zilpah, has also given two sons to Jacob. So now the score is tied. This is crazy. Then we see that Leah names her two sons Gad, which means good fortune, and Asher, which means happy. So it's kind of like Leah saying, you got vindicated in struggle, but I got good fortune and happy. Honestly, I think the only one that was happy in all this was Jacob. <laughs> okay, back to the text. Verse 14. Now we, now we go into almost like a side note, a side story. Check this out in verse 14. During wheat harvest, Reuben, remember, he was the firstborn of, of Leah, and his name meant misery. Remember that? Now he's out in the fields. During wheat harvest, Reuben went out in the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother, Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Because I think that's how she said it. My husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. Poor Jacob. <laughs> he just got sold for some mandrakes. Some of you are like, well, what's a mandrake? Mandrakes were a Mediterranean plant, 
in the nightshade family with blue flowers in the winter and yellow fruit in the summer. And mandrakes in the Bible were often associated with fertility or sexuality. So Rachel wanted the mandrakes in hope that it would help her with her fertility and conception, and some believed that the seeds from the mandrake would enhance this fertility. Also, back in the Middle Ages, the Arabs would call mandrakes the devil's apple because of its supposed ability to be an exciting aphrodisiac. No, ladies, don't go to the doctor and ask for any mandrakes. <laughs> Excuse me, doctor, can I have some mandrakes? We don't know what that is, and we don't have any. Okay, can I have a man? No, we ain't got that either. What about Drake? Nope, Drake's not here either. Just, just focus on the Lord. Okay, verse 16. So when Jacob came in from the fields that evening, Leah went out to meet him. You must sleep with me, she said. Okay. <laughs> no. You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah. and She became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Now, this can be all very confusing. Remember, the last four boys that were born were of maidservants. So this is Jacob's fifth son with Leah. Keep up. Verse 18. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my maidservant to my husband. So she named him Issachar, which means reward. Verse 19, Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has presented me with a precious gift, our key verse. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I have borne him six sons. So she named him Zebulon, which means honor. We got to add all this up, y'all. I mean, pull it, pulling it all together, Leah had four sons. Then Rachel gave her maidservant Bilhah, and he had two sons. Then Leah gave her maidservant Zilpah two more sons. And then Leah had two more sons naturally, number six and number seven. So if you add it all up, that's ten. Now, if you keep reading later in the, in the passages in the coming chapters, we find out that Rachel had two more boys or had two sons herself. This rounds out the 12 sons which become the 12 tribes of Israel. What's interesting is they really only count the boys. Remember male-dominated society, right? But what you don't know, and, and we won't go past verse 20, but in verse 21, what you don't know, it says that then she had a daughter named Dinah. I just think it's interesting that that was the seventh child. Seven is the perfect number. I don't, maybe they didn't get it right for the last six, but the seventh is the perfect number, and that's Dinah. But back to the passage now, we know that we have these, we have these children, but it's the seventh one that I sort of want to wrap everything up with because at the end of the day, this story is all about desiring love with all its twists and turns. It's like a Hollywood film with jealousy and anger and a whole lot of baby mama drama. And then we get to this verse 20 that we'll focus on for our final few minutes together. And it says, God has presented me with a precious gift. Here it is. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I bore him six sons. Six children later, Leah still trying to capture the heart of her husband, Jacob. She believes that Jacob will honor her now just because she's given him children. Friends, I want you to know that in her brain, she's saying, no, she's literally screaming in her brain these two words. Love me. Love me. Love me. Honor me. Honor me. See me. See me. Jacob, I need your approval. Jacob, I want you to honor me in front of my sister and my family and my friends. Jacob, please love me more than Rachel. Just love me. Have you ever been in this place before? 
<laughs> Don't say amen too loud. You just want to be seen. You just want to be loved. You just want to be noticed. You just want to be honored. You just want to be valued. And then jealousy sets in when you see others and you, you see their social media post. Jealousy begins to set in when you see that person skinnier or richer or tanner or traveling further or eating better or publicly displaying affection with their partner more loudly and proudly than yours. Onla online, that person has the perfect house, the perfect spouse, perfect kids. Online, your acquaintances from school, they have more followers, they have more friends, they have more fans, they have more fun than you. Even spiritually in church, the women seem like they're holier, the men seem like they're godlier, the students seem like they're cooler, and the other's children seem like they have even more talent. Everybody on stage around me sings better, dresses nicer, plays instruments better, play, prays to God more fervently, and, and they serve God more regularly, and, and they attend more classes and more church events than I can. After a while, all you hear in your brain is, I suck. And you may not say it out loud, but deep inside your heart, that's how you feel. And you wonder deep down inside of your heart while smiling outside for everybody else. But deep in your heart, you're asking the question, what's wrong with me? And I came here to tell you today that nothing is wrong with you. That God does love you. And he does see you. But, you know, these kind of comparisons are just not good for your souls, friends. For some of you, maybe, maybe you need to take a break from social media. Because instead of you having social media, social media has you. And it's wrecking your mental health. It's wrecking your soul. Not because it's bad in and of itself, but because you are now so deep into it, you begin to, to start valuing yourself based on the number of likes, the number of followers, and the number of happy posts that you can't seem to generate, so you fake it for the world. So how do you deal with what I call the Leah effect in your own life? The Leah effect is that Verse 20, feeling like this time my husband will treat me with honor. Did you get it? This time. Meaning that you've been trying and trying to win that person's approval. You've been trying and trying to win that person's honor. You've been trying and trying to somehow get that person to treat you right. You've been birthing one performance after the next performance after the next performance, hoping that finally you will be seen. Finally, you will be noticed. Finally, you will be loved. Friends, this is the Leia effect. It's when you feel less loved, so you work harder to earn it. And I'm here to tell you this. And this is what I, this is what I put in my Friday textpiration. Here it is. I quote, God loves you just the way you are. You never have to earn his love. You just need to believe it, receive it, and extend it to others. Thank God for loving you that way. Every Friday morning, 7 a.m., I send out a free text, an inspirational text, a shot in the arm. If you want that, just text the word INSPIRE, I-N-S-P-I-R-E, INSPIRE, to 97,000. One word, and you'll start getting that text. Here, let me give you a final and fourth practical application. Here's the last one. You ready? Stop begging people to love you and start training people how to treat you, whether they ever love you or not. Can I say it again? Stop begging people to love you and start training people how to treat you, whether they ever love you or not. You don't have to love me, but you will treat me with honor. You don't have to love me, but you do have to respect me. 
You will not treat me with disrespect. I will not allow you to treat me with dishonor. I will not allow you to walk on or over me like I don't have feelings. I will not allow you to take advantage of me like I'm a nobody. Friends, you might have to declare some things out loud to hear yourself speak them out to yourself. Like, I am a human. I am somebody. I am a person with feelings. I am loved by God. God created me in his image. I am an image bearer of almighty God. I'm a child of the most high God. I am not an animal, and I am not an object for your entertainment. You may not love me, but God loves me. And it's time for me to love me. I will love me because he loves me. I will love me because he created me. I will not hate me, even if you do. I will not devalue me, even if you don't recognize my value. You may not love me. You may not honor me. But I love me. The command of God is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I will love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my strength, and I will love my neighbor as myself. I love me. I am not in love with myself, but I'm not giving myself permission to, to embrace selfish pride or self-centeredness. Of course, self-love can go too far. But healthy self-love that's surrendered to the, the love of God and the lordship of Christ and the movement of the Holy Spirit is a healthy thing. But I will not devour or de devalue myself with self-hate either. I will not cut myself. I will not harm myself. I will not punish myself with damaging eating habits or addictive behaviors. I am too valuable to God and too valuable to myself to harm myself. I will love myself enough to get professional help. I will love myself enough to covenant in prayer with people at the altar at church or on the phone for spiritual support. I will love myself enough to text 988 if I have feelings like I am suicidal or I just need to talk to someone because I don't want to be here anymore. 988. Just text it and send. Don't even have to write anything. And someone will get in touch with you. That may be where you're at right now. Someone at Owens Mills, someone online, someone sitting in the car or in their kitchen or in their bed right now with their holding the phone up. And you've been thinking about self-harm. You've been thinking about getting out of this place. Text 988. Why? Because you're valuable. And you need to tell yourself, I will not harm myself anymore. I am going to love me because of who God created, not because of him or because of something that has happened in my life. God loves me. I will love me. Not out of pride, not out of righteousness, not out of arrogance. But you know, it's okay to love yourself a little bit. You're awesome. And God don't make junk. So whenever you're hating on yourself, you're saying, God, you didn't do right. But God is saying, you're made in my image. I'm not made in your image. The way you're looking at yourself is because you're trying to make me in your image or you're trying to make me in the image of somebody else that you're jealous of. You're not made in your own image and I'm not made in your image. You're made in my image. That means that your worth and your value is caught up in me creating you. And I don't make junk. 
So treat yourself some time to a Krispy Kreme donut when the red light's on. <laughs> a crumble cookie or cold stone. Amen. Amen, a cold stone. Ice cream scoop or my favorite, a Dairy Queen blizzard or a slice of pecan pie. Even if you're a little overweight. You want to color your hair blue like Micah, the guy that plays the keyboards? Go ahead. He's got a hat on. You can't see it, you know, but he has blue hair. That's what you want to do. You know what? Love your blue hair itself. I will love me. But I will love me out of humility. I will not think of myself more highly than I ought to think. And I will look to serve others more highly than myself. But I refuse to see myself as less. Even if I'm less loved by you, I'm loved more by God. I refuse to see myself as less. I've been praying about this moment. And I get a sense that what I'm saying is really connecting to some souls. Whether that's here in Columbia or right there at Owens Mills. So if, if, if what I just said, especially about refusing to see yourself as less, I'm going to give you an opportunity to express an act of self-love by standing to your feet so I can speak directly to you. If that is you, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, if this message is somehow speaking right to your soul, stand to your feet. Yes, right there at Owens Mills. Right here in the house. This is the first act of self-love. I invite you to stand. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. I'm going to speak it right into your spirit. It may go in your ears, but I'm praying that it goes into your spiritual ears and right down to your heart and right down to your soul. But it will take a little bit of humility and courage to stand in a big old place like this and in a big old place like that. And for those of you that are at home right now, that's your little private sanctuary. No one can see you, but you can stand where you are. Just hold the phone up and stand. Because I'm about to speak to you something. And I'm going to speak it right past your mind into your soul so that it literally the next time you start feeling any of these negative feelings, that these words will begin to bubble up in your spirit. Is there anybody else that feels a need to stand? Now's the time to do it. It's okay. Take your time. Something's about to break as you stand, something is about to break. I already feel it in my spirit. I've had people praying for this moment. The enemy is not going to win. Anybody else at Owens Mills right now, one more call to just stand to receive what I'm about to speak into your spirit. Are you ready? You are not loveless. You are not worthless. You are a servant of the Most High God. You are a princess of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are a prince a son, not just a soldier of Almighty God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm speaking it into your spirit right now. You may not be rich, but your daddy's rich. You may not be perfect, but your daddy's perfect. You will no longer be afflicted by the disease of the Leah effect. And in this moment, I'm calling it out that God is turning the Leah effect into a love effect. Into your spirit right now. 
Do you receive that? Now I'm going to ask all of you to stand to your feet right now at Owens Mills and here in Columbia because by faith I want you to declare these seven declarations. And this is true for every single one who is in the body of Christ. So this is how we'll end with these seven declarations. They'll be up on the screen. Maybe you can take a picture later, but I really want you to be able to declare it. And the reason I say take a picture later is because you might need to read this back to yourself at another time when the whole crowd's not around, okay? So see them up there. If you need to take a picture, do it right now. Go ahead, really quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's on your screen. You can screenshot it. You never know when you're going to need this. Save it in your picture gallery or something, but these things we're going to declare out loud. Put it on a postcard. Put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your mirror. We're going to say it together. Are you ready? Let's go. Number one, I am the head and not the tail. Number two, I am above and not beneath. I am chosen and not forsaken. I am blessed and highly favored. I am alive and grateful. I am a child of God. I may be loved less by people, but I am loved the best by Almighty God. Come on and give God some praise. Those are your seven declarations, and it's true. So we speak it into your spirit, we speak it into your heart, and we rebuke any lie that the enemy has told you. Stop trying to pop out babies for somebody else. You start realizing that you are loved more by God and not loved less. God loves you just the way you are. Someone else said that he loves you just the way you are, but he also loves you too much to leave you that way. Let's give God praise one more time for the Leia series.